In 1992, we received a message from the Union of Concerned Scientists. The warning was simple. If we didn't make a choice between the war and devastation for which states were spending trillions of dollars and the investment in a more just and sustainable future, then we were, in inevitability, going to be left with a world mutilated, devastated, and unlivable for the human species. 25 years later, we've had to hear the message again. This time, it's not 1,500 scientists that are warning us about the end, it's 15,000 scientists. And again, we're confronted with a choice to pursue war or to pursue justice and sustainability. If the last 25 years tell us nothing, it's that those who have the power to make that choice choose war time and time again. This book, Savage Ecology, tries to think through all of the spaces, all of the actors, from cars to horses, to Neanderthals, to the indigenous people struggling against pipelines, to the fights we now have over the automation of war, the blood supplies that keep soldiers alive. All of these things, these circulations, these objects, these people, these non-human people, formulate the savage ecology that now governs contemporary politics. It's a global order of terraforming, of making a planet for geopolitics, and a making that was always made with war and violence. We live in an age of the tyranny of techno-optimists. It seems as if the eject button for global catastrophe is to ride a Tesla all the way to Mars. Elon Musk's vision, Peter Thiel's vision, these visions of a planet in which we can either upload our consciousness to global data banks circling the planet, or in which we can find new ways to expand beyond our imagination on the surface of Mars, don't represent an alternative to the catastrophe, to the Eurocene. They represent its terminal velocity, that cruelty can exceed the limits of planetary systems, can exceed the limits of capital's contradiction. What's most telling, and I think most dangerous, is who they're willing to sacrifice in order to do it. Imagine a world of automation, not just of labor, not just of military, but an automation of both, where we are no longer needed as citizens precisely because we're not needed for work or for war. This is the vision which now comes to be seen as the good news. What we see on the desert highways of the vision of Fury Road, the reinvention of Mad Max, is precisely the inversion of Frederick Jameson's once famous phrase that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine an end to capitalism. I think we're in exactly the opposite moment, in which it's easier to imagine an end to capitalism, either a future of space colonization and endless growth, breaking free of the reins of capital, or to imagine some new accelerationist luxury communism in a mass automated and industrial world. The imagination we need now is to understand the limits of those visions, the fact that they could come to a grinding halt, that they can collapse, that we can be left in the dust of that planet. And think about what it would mean, what kind of forms of life, what ways of living we'd want to hold on to, that we wouldn't be willing to sacrifice in those transformations. And think about the violence and the sadism that will come with those insistences of living in a new world. <laughs>